The cell has many specialized ways to bring materials into and out of the cell, many of which depend on the fluidity in the membrane as well as the proteins present. In this video, we will discuss the HL topics of fluidity in the lipid bilayer, including the presence of saturated and unsaturated fats, as well as the function of cholesterol in maintaining fluidity. We will also discuss vesicle formation in endocytosis and exocytosis. We'll also look at voltage-gated channels and discuss how the sodium-potassium pump operates. Finally, we'll see how SGLTs transport glucose using concentration gradients maintained by the sodium-potassium pump, as well as how CAMs join cells together to form tissues in a variety of ways. These key concepts are some of the most important topics covered in the IB biology syllabus at the higher level. The fluidity of cell membranes depends largely on the fatty acid composition of the lipid bilayers. Lipid bilayers consist of phospholipids, which have two fatty acid tails that can vary in saturation. Unsaturated fatty acids contain one or more double bonds, causing kinks in the tails that prevent tight packing, thereby lowering the membrane's melting point. This lower melting point results in greater fluidity and flexibility, allowing the membrane to adapt to colder temperatures. Cells in cold habitats, such as those in polar organisms, often have a higher proportion of unsaturated fatty acids to maintain fluidity. Conversely, saturated fatty acids lack double bonds, making the membrane more rigid and stable, which is beneficial at warmer temperatures. Terrestrial animals in hotter climates often exhibit higher concentrations of saturated fatty acids to stabilize their membranes against temperature fluctuations. Cholesterol is a critical modulator of membrane fluidity in animal cells. Positioned between the fatty acid tails of phospholipids in the bilayer, the amphipathic nature of cholesterol allows the molecule to interact with both the hydrophobic and hydrophilic portions of the membrane. The hydrophobic steroid ring structure of cholesterol aligns with the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids in the interior of the bilayer, while the polar hydroxyl group at the cholesterol's head is positioned towards the hydrophilic surface of the membrane. Cholesterol plays a dual role. At high temperatures, it stabilizes the membrane by preventing excessive movement of phospholipids, thus reducing the fluidity. And at low temperatures, it has the opposite effect. How does this work? At low temperatures, the phospholipids don't have a lot of kinetic energy, so they don't move around a lot. This causes them to be packed tightly together. The tight packing causes the membrane's fluidity to be much lower. At high temperatures, the lipids have more kinetic energy, and they move around a little more. This creates more of a distance between the lipids. This increased distance creates more fluidity in the membrane. So how does cholesterol affect this fluidity? At high temperatures, if the membrane becomes too fluid, it may fall apart or melt, and the cell can no longer maintain a controlled internal environment. The insertion of cholesterol helps pack together the phospholipids so that the fluidity decreases back to a more stabilized membrane. At low temperatures, there's less kinetic energy, and cholesterol prevents the fatty acids from packing too tightly. Reducing membrane fluidity can negatively affect cells as it reduces the permeability of the membrane barrier and it affects the functions of proteins and reduces the ability to form vesicles for transport. This unique ability to adjust membrane fluidity across temperature ranges makes cholesterol crucial for maintaining the integrity of cellular membranes in diverse environments. In animal cells, cholesterol's balancing effect on fluidity is essential for membrane stability and function, especially in tissues exposed to variable temperature changes, similar to the idea that saturated fatty acids stabilize membranes. Lastly, the amount of cholesterol in the membrane affects membrane fluidity. At higher concentrations, the membrane fluidity is reduced, and the membrane is more rigid. Conversely, lower levels of cholesterol maintain fluidity of the membrane. For example, in the Golgi apparatus, the cholesterol levels are low to moderate in the Golgi membrane as the Golgi apparatus processes and transports lipids and proteins, which requires a more flexible membrane for the formation of vesicles. Mitochondria also have low levels of cholesterol as the fluidity helps maintain the function of the cristae, where many reactions take place, ultimately making ATP. Membrane fluidity is not only essential for maintaining membrane structure, but also for enabling dynamic cellular processes 
such as endocytosis and exocytosis. In endocytosis, a portion of the cell membrane engulfs external particles or fluids, forming a vesicle that transports the contents into the cell. Exocytosis is the reverse process, where internal vesicles fuse with the cell membrane to release their contents outside the cell. For these processes to occur seamlessly, the membrane must be sufficiently fluid to allow bending and fusion. This fluid nature of the membrane allows cells to intake essential nutrients and export waste products efficiently. Membrane fluidity, supported by specific lipid compositions and cholesterol, is therefore crucial in maintaining the cell's adaptability and responsiveness to environmental and physiological demands. An example of exocytosis is seen in the synapse, where neurotransmitters are released from the presynaptic neuron through exocytosis, then diffuse across the synapse. Gated ion channels are specialized protein channels in the cell membrane that regulate the movement of ions, such as sodium and potassium, which are critical for neuron functioning. There are two primary types of gated ion channels, ligand-gated channels and voltage-gated channels. Ligand-gated ion channels open in response to a molecule acting as a chemical messenger, which binds to the target molecule to initiate a biological response. The ligand may be a small molecule or a larger molecule, such as a hormone or neurotransmitter. In this example here, at the synapse, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine binds to a nictinic acetylcholine receptor of another neuron, opening a gated sodium channel, causing sodium ions to enter the postsynaptic neuron. The influx of ions generates a nerve impulse. Sodium and potassium channels, on the other hand, are voltage-gated, whose gates will open or close in response to changes in membrane potential. These gated ion channels are essential for transmitting electrical signals, the action potential, across neurons, enabling functions like muscle contraction, heartbeat, and cognition. The precise regulation of these channels contributes to the rapid and controlled responses required for effective neural communication. The sodium-potassium pump is a key example of an exchange transporter crucial for maintaining membrane potential in animals. This pump uses ATP to actively transport three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions into the cell. This activity creates a gradient with a higher concentration of sodium outside the cell and potassium inside. This ion distribution establishes an electrochemical gradient, contributing to the cell's membrane potential, which is vital for nerve impulses, muscle contractions, and overall cell health. By maintaining ion balance and supporting membrane potential, the sodium-potassium pump is fundamental to the physiological function of cells, particularly excitable cells like neurons and muscle cells. In the case of the sodium-potassium pump, also known as sodium-potassium ATPase, three sodium ions bind to the pump protein from the interior of the neuron. ATP will convert to ADP when it releases a phosphate group through hydrolysis of the phosphate that will bind to the pump. The addition of the phosphate and sodium ions causes a shift in the protein's three-dimensional shape, which results in it releasing the three sodium ions to the exterior of the cell. The change in the protein's shape with the release of sodium allows two potassium ions from the exterior of the cell to bind to the protein. This causes another change in the protein's shape, which causes the release of the potassium ions to the inside of the cell. The phosphate group also releases which changes the protein's shape back to its original form, and it's ready to complete the cycle again to pump more ions. The pump allows for the electrochemical gradient to be established and maintained, so the neuron can transmit the action potential. Sodium-dependent glucose cotransporters, or SGLTs, illustrate a type of indirect active transport, crucial for the absorption and reabsorption of glucose in the body. These co-transporters rely on the energy of the sodium gradient, which is established by the sodium-potassium pump, also known as sodium-potassium ATPase, actively transporting sodium out of the cell, creating a higher concentration outside. This gradient provides the driving force that allows SGLTs to move glucose into cells against its concentration gradient. Even though SGLTs themselves do not use ATP directly, Instead, as sodium ions flow back into the cell down their concentration gradient, glucose is co-transported into the cell with sodium. 
This process is essential in cells lining the small intestine and in the nephron tubules of the kidneys, where efficient glucose absorption and reabsorption are vital. In the small intestine, these co-transporters enable cells to take up glucose from the digestive tract and the membranes of the microvilli, providing the body with a primary energy source. In the nephron, SGLTs facilitate glucose reabsorption from the filtrate, ensuring that the valuable glucose does not exit the body in urine, but is instead reclaimed for energy use. Cell adhesion molecules, or CAMs, are essential for the organization and stability of tissues, as they enable cells to adhere to one another and form structured networks. These molecules mediate specific interactions between cells, allowing them to connect and communicate, which is crucial for tissue function and integrity. Different types of CAMs are specialized for various forms of cell-to-cell -cell junctions. For example, some CAMs are involved in tight junctions, which create a seal between adjacent cells, preventing substances from passing between them. For instance, tight junctions are seen in the small intestine, where having undigested nutrients leaking across the gut would be problematic. Others are used in desmosomes, which provide structural support by anchoring cells together, which can allow tissues to stretch without breaking the sheet of tissue. Plants often produce plasmodesmata, which are cams with hollow tubes that connects the cytoplasm of cells. This allows for transport between the cytoplasm of cells, which often involves water and dissolved solutes like sugars. The diversity of cams allows for the specialization needed to form and maintain different tissue types throughout the body. In this video, we saw how the fats in the phospholipid bilayer can help regulate fluidity and that unsaturated fats increase fluidity for organisms that live in cold temperatures, while saturated fats make the membrane more rigid for organisms that live in hot temperatures. We also discussed the function of cholesterol in the membrane and that it stabilizes the membrane at high temperatures and keeps it fluid at low temperatures. We also looked at how the membrane can form vesicles to bring in bulk materials through endocytosis and absorb vesicles to excrete materials through exocytosis. We looked at proteins in the membrane, including gated ion channels that can be triggered to open by ligands or changes in membrane potential. We also looked at the sodium potassium pump as an example of an exchange transporter that maintains the membrane potential in animal cells. We reviewed sodium-dependent glucose co-transporters or SGLTs, and saw how they relied on the sodium-potassium pump to create a sodium gradient to co-transport glucose. Finally, we saw how cell adhesion molecules create junctions between cells that can vary from different cell types and tissues.